stories. This happened when I was about 17 years old. I had just gotten a job at Dollar General and I was working the late shift. I had to walk home because my car had blown up shortly before I got the job. My neighborhood is relatively safe, just the occasional crackhead or drunk roaming around at night, but they did not bother anyone. One night when I was getting ready to close, this hipster guy comes in and he starts asking weird questions about products that we don't sell. He then locks the doors. I told him he wasn't allowed to lock the doors like that. He slapped me really hard and told me to shut the fuck up. Then he pulled out a knife. I ran and hid in the back area where we keep the overstock. He started calling out to me, Kathy, where are you? Come on, Kathy, give me what I want and I won't kill you. I was scared to death. I could only assume that he wanted to rape me. I hid and snuck around the boxes, trying to make sure that I did not knock anything over. I had to make it back to the front of the store and get out. I was unable to get out from the loading area because I needed a key card in order to open the door, and only the managers have key cards. The creepy hipster guy found me and snatched me up by my hair and put the knife to my throat and told me to lay still and it would all be over soon. I was scared to death. In fact, I was so frightened that I pissed on myself, which enraged the hipster. You nasty fucking bitch. How am I supposed to fuck you when you have piss all over you? He screamed at me as he yanked on my hair as hard as he could. For some odd reason, the dollar store that I worked at had a shower. No other store I have ever seen had a shower. The hipster guy threw me in the shower and demanded that I washed myself off as he pulled out a gun. I stood there in the shower and rinsed off with tears streaming down my face. He threw me a towel and told me to get to my car and don't do anything funny. I told him that I don't have a car. This enraged him even more. Fine then, lay down and don't make a fucking sound. I begged him not to do anything to me. He laughed at me. I'm going to get what I came here for, even if I have to kill you, he replied. He then fired his gun at the roof, and I guess he wasn't paying attention, or by the grace of God, the bullet came down and landed in his skull. I watched in horror and relief as blood leaked from the top of his head and his lifeless body fell to the floor. I called the police and they knew who he was. Apparently this guy had attempted to rape three other women and was successful in one other case. The paramedics took his body and they checked me, etc. The manager fired me because she said it was my fault for not taking proper precautions. Yeah, fuck you, bitch. When I was a kid, there was this creepy guy that lived next to my parents' house. Although he was a bit creepy, not in a disgusting way though, he just had some odd beliefs and lived an unusual lifestyle. He was a goth and also a Satanist. He didn't sacrifice children or anything stupid like that. He just practiced an unusual form of Satanism that some of you may have heard of. He wasn't a LeVay Satanist as most people are aware of when they think of modern Satanism. He was an active practitioner of the Joy of Satan Ministries. Now, for those of you who aren't aware of it, Joy of Satan Ministries is involved in some weird stuff. The worst thing of all, though, is that some of the members are neo-Nazis. 
though many of them reject the racist nonsense on the website and only follow the theological aspects of it, which are as follows. They believe that Enki is Satan and that his brother Enlil is the god that the Christians worship and that they are aliens from another universe that came here to enslave mankind and that Enki fought against Enlil and the other Anunnaki and that all ancient forms of paganism are actually Satanism and that Satanism is the oldest religion in the world. Now, while this is weird, something much worse was lurking just beyond his walls. He had a younger brother. The younger brother, Marvin, was your typical neckbeard. Fat, smelly, wore a fedora, greasy hair, watched anime, etc. I was about 12 years old at the time, and Marvin invited me to come over and watch anime with him. For some reason, my parents did not think it was strange for a 12-year-old girl to go and hang out with a 25-year-old man alone. They didn't think anything at all. Honestly, I'm sure that they just didn't give a fuck. My parents were drug addicts. They smoked crystal meth and they were strung out most of the time, and they'd fight a lot. So I go over to creepy Satanist guy's house to watch anime with his brother Marvin, and everything seems fine. There is nothing weird. I do this several times. I'd even go over there whenever my parents would invite other dope heads over and have their parties. Around about the 20th time or so I went over there, Marvin asked me, Do you like hentai? I had no clue what he was talking about. I told him that I did not know what he was referring to, and he just smiled. Then he went to his room and brought out at least 50 DVDs of hentai. I was repulsed and scared when I seen the artwork of some of them. I looked at him and asked him, What is this? He smiled again and simply replied, It's anime. Marvin popped one of the DVDs in and it was straight up animated CP. He pulled his pants off and started jerking off and then he waved me over and told me to put it in my mouth. I was terrified and confused. I told him I had to go home and he put his pants back on and bowed his head in shame and simply said, Okay, I'm sorry I frightened you. Marvin allowed me to leave and I went back home and went straight to my room and cried. I contemplated calling the cops and telling them what had happened, but my parents being drug addicts and having drug addicts at the house, I did not want to deal with the drama of if one of them got arrested I told Marvin's brother about what had happened, and Marvin's brother quietly walked in the house. Then about five minutes later, I heard a gunshot, and then the police arrived moments later. Marvin's brother shot and killed Marvin, and then called the cops, and reported that he had just murdered his brother. This certainly wasn't what I wanted to happen. Yes, what Marvin did was wrong, exposing himself to a 12-year-old like he did. And yes, he did proposition me for oral sex, which is illegal again. But he didn't try to force me to stay, and he did not force himself on me. Marvin was just sick and needed help, but apparently his brother was a dangerous psychopath. Marvin's brother showed no remorse for murdering his brother, and my parents would always just call me a dirty bitch or a nasty fucking whore. They seemed to believe that I was having sex with Marvin. They honestly think that their 12-year-old daughter was having sex with a fucking 25-year-old man. They also seemed to believe that Marvin's brother was jealous and wanted to have sex with me as well. And that's the real reason he murdered his brother.
I'm standing outside the ICU doors in a hospital, trying to get a glimpse of my father, who is lying inside on a standard issue hospital bed with faded but crisp blue sheets. He's under heavy sedation. Third worst day of my life. I'm throwing up in the sink at five in the morning while my mother holds my hair back. I look up at my face in the oval mirror, my complexion waxy and pillared. I feel like the terror itself is trying to fight its way out of my system. I've spent the entire day approaching members of my society and telling them over and over again that I'm being sexually harassed. No one listens to me. May 22nd, 2019. I'm sitting in the women's cell of the local police station next to the assistant police inspector. The constable has just taken my statement. I'm cold, hungry, and exhausted. I have filed an FIR for the first time in my life, and it's given me diarrhea. It seems strange that the three most traumatic days of my life are centered around one man. One man, virtually a stranger, who, for some inexplicable reason, had become obsessed with me. In early 2016, my family and I were renting a three-bedroom apartment close to my college, where I was pursuing a degree in law. My father, an ex-fighter pilot from the Indian Air Force, had just retired from military service and taken a job as an instructor at one of the most eminent flying schools in India. His job needed him to stay far away in a small town where the flying school had been set up. At home, it was basically my mother and I and the dog. From 2016 to 2019, I was stalked and sexually harassed by a man from my society. Our society was situated on a hill, an arrangement of four 11-story buildings standing haphazardly on uneven ground. The only public access road was highly visible, so the comings and goings of residents could be monitored at all times. In my case, it regularly was. He had the uncanny ability to know exactly when I went out and show up there. To this day, I wonder how he knew. Who was telling him? I marvel at the gall of all those who enable stalkers. I have worked in the field of women and children's rights since I was in my early 20s. I remember my first street harassment protest when I wrote slogans on the road with colored chalk, my body, my space. One of the first things an activist told me was, be smart. In March 2018, he finally lost his wits, grabbed my hand, and tried to touch me in the middle of the road. When my mother forcibly broke the hold he had on me, we decided we had had enough. Trusting that a respectable residential society would take action, we approached the chairman, the secretary, and the manager of the committee. We even took the initiative to politely request the boy's mother and ask her to intervene if she could speak to her son and ask him to respect my space. We could end the matter there. Instead, the secretary called up my mother shouted at her and warned us not to go to the police. We would not be able to prove it. We should talk it out with the boy and try to see his side of things. Oh, what? Who says that? She's in the call by asking us to think of the boy's future. There was no thought of my future. The conversation was so shady that it led to us to believe that this lady was up to something. She seemed complicit in my harassment. I was grievously ill after making the complaint. I had final exams in 15 days. I barely got through those, surviving on electrolytes and biscuits 
but I was determined to complete my education. Then my father came home to see me, worried about the complaint before he could do anything about it though. He was struck by violent seizures. My father suffers from a neurological disease and is dependent on medication. When he forgot to take his medication because he was stressing out over me, he ended up triggering his condition. We had to rush him to the local hospital where he was in the ICU for three days. He then had to keep under observation for about a week before we could bring him home. For six months after that, I did not step out of the house. I fell into a deep depression, the kind that comes when those who are supposed to protect you fail to do so. I believe it's called institutional betrayal. I was diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome due to extreme stress. I suffered from migraines, nausea, heartburn, and diarrhea, fatigue, and dizzy spells. I was living in constant fear, fear that my stalker was casing me. He wanted to know what I wore, who I spoke to, where I lived, and who I lived with, and when I went out, what car I drove, the place I worked, my friends, the sound of my voice, and things I talk about. Stalking and sexual harassment are simply the preliminary steps a criminal takes so he can do what he's ultimately out to do, like abduction, murder, or rape. I spoke to a women's rights activist who told me I had done the right thing and that it should work. She asked me to wait and see if my stalker had gotten the message and would back off. If he did not, then I needed to start recording him in the act whenever I went out and he showed up. I should have my phone with me and record him while he committed the crime. This was very sound advice because if and when you decide to go to the police, you must have proof. From September 2018 to March 2019, my mother and I deliberately and diligently recorded him whenever he came too close. We found out that he had filed a complaint against me for intimidating him. It seemed like speaking up had offended him in some way. Instead of ensuring my safety, his family and the society members were choosing to shield him. They had undoubtedly emboldened him. We realized we needed to move to a new place as soon as I finished college. In 2019, just as we were about to move into our new home, the secondary contacted us. The boy and his family were planning to file yet another complaint against me for breach of privacy. Again, she suggested rather smugly that we should talk to the boy and give him a chance. The woman was practically crowing so gleefully was she at the thought that she had cornered me into talking to him. I still remember what I said to her. That very night at 10 p.m., my mother and I went to the police station and filed an FIR. We had ample proof. First, we had complained to the society and asked it to put a stop to it. Second, we had witnessed my doctor and my best friend who was an advocate and could collaborate. Third, we had electronic evidence, months of videos of stalking. Last, we had my prescription for antacids and sleeping pills. I'm still on those. The policemen at the women's cell were truly incredible. They helped me go over my story until I could recall every detail with clarity and give them a true account of everything that had happened. They arrested him immediately and put him in lockup for nearly 12 hours. He was let out on bail later. They conducted the investigation thoroughly and within a week filed the charge sheet. 
they took me to the Sessions Court where I gave my witness statement to the judicial magistrate. I actually stood inside a witness box and cried my heart out. I talked about how I'd lost three years of my life, how I had no idea what I was going to do with my life anymore, how I was too sick to find a job or get married, how I had to leave within a few days of filing the FIR and move to a secure home, as the police had told me that this man was mentally insane and therefore dangerous. On a side note, they also told me that it seemed more like a conspiracy to force me to marry the stalker than anything else. Here's what you need to know about my stalker. He already had a girlfriend, and his girlfriend knew what he was doing, yet she supported him. His mother knew what he was doing, and yet she harbored him. The secretary knew what he was doing, yet she defended him. There was never an apology. Any man who stalks and harasses with impunity does so because there are women who approve it. Victimization of innocent girls is a hobby. It's entertainment. Sexual predators are not born. They are made. It is not men who are sexually deviant. It is society which is sexually deviant. After I moved into our new home, the peace and quiet was unbearable. I couldn't believe I was actually safe. I was hyper-vigilant. I had panic attacks. I had nightmares and flashbacks. I locked doors, took no calls, refused to go out of my apartment, broke off from my friends, and stopped eating. I would get very angry. Then I'd suddenly start crying. I would cut vegetables for lunch and hold the blade to my wrist. I'd lean over the balcony railing and lean down as far as I could go. I'd calculate the number of sleeping pills it would take to never wake up again. I'd look up at the ceiling fan and imagine hanging from it. If I went to get groceries, I'd have this sudden urge to throw myself on the road in the way of a car. I was having a nervous breakdown. When I started therapy, I was diagnosed with depression, anxiety, and PTSD. The day I started healing was the day I accepted that I was safe. I had not let him get to me. I had not let him hurt me. I did the right thing. It wasn't my fault. I was okay. I was going to face him in court one day, and I was going to see him punished. I needed to live so I could see how justice was served. I could let go and move on. I got my degree in law and a diploma in counseling. I started my own business as a legal consultant and counselor for women and children. I started a support group for women's mental health. I devised a safety plan for victims of domestic violence. I did an online workshop on reporting sexual harassment. I became an activist for gender equality and mental health. I took whatever had broken me, and then I remade myself. Today, I feel gratitude, not for being stalked and harassed, but for knowing what to do when it happened. I feel grateful to my parents who raised me properly. I am grateful to my teachers who taught me criminal law, to the API and constable who helped me, to my support group who showed me empathy to my doctor who treated me, to my therapist who helped me heal, to the judge who listened to me compassionately, and to the women's rights advocate who empowered me.